Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to what is BIMSA's very first Zoom um, event, um, well, actually hosted by, um, by UMSA. We've had a couple of Zoom events last year there where we had other associations or organizations assisting us, but now our team is stepping up and they are Zooming away. So congratulations to the events team for taking on a new platform and having lots of fun with it, I saw this morning. So well done to all of you. And, and as well, our very first um, SMME event webinar, we had a, a stream at our conference last year, but this is our very first uh, webinar that we'll be hosting. So a warm welcome to all of you and a very exciting morning. And I think, you know, looking at SMMEs at the moment in terms of where we are as a country, more than ever, the importance of our SMME succeeding and, you know, really building strong foundations, um, the time is now. We've seen in terms of the impact on the economy last year, on all organizations um, where we have been impacted from a South African point of view and a global point of view, um, where our SMMEs will now really need to help support the country to step up. But at the same time, the challenges, uh, you know, that we're seeing with our SMMEs at the moment, um, more than ever. So how do we do it? And how do we ensure that we have that sustainability how do we make sure that we can still make the impact and grow? How do we make sure that we are the SMMEs that we can survive going forward? 2021, a very, very important year for all of us. So what do we do to ensure that we empower the SMMEs in these organizations and to support the SMMEs in the country to make sure that we do make this to 2022, but not just make it, but make it powerfully and with an impact. So what are we going to do? So this morning's discussions are vital in terms of where we are. And, um, and so before I can even begin, I'd really like to thank IGS Solutions. And um, they are the sponsor and partner for this morning's event. Just seeing how important the discussion is, they jumped in to say, we would like to brand and be part of this discussion and make sure that we're getting the message out. So a huge thank you to all of you. So for those of you who do not know who IGS Solutions are, um, Agile Solutions brings tomorrow's technology solutions today with the use of advanced cloud and automation technologies embracing the fourth industrial revolution. The system becomes your system due to the extensive customization that they provide as primary developers. So very exciting um, solution that IGS Solutions provides and well worth a visit to their website, which I'm sure um, a little bit later their, their website address will come on the screen and you'll be able to go and have a look. But a huge thank you to IGS Solutions for making it possible this morning because the discussions we're going to have today are vital. Uh, we have Diane Boerman, um, who is, an, and I love what her title is. She's the Business Enabler and Growth Accelerator. She is the founder of um, Brand Analytics, so who will really be able to give impact and thought into this discussion. So really looking forward to that. Followed by, and excuse my uh, pronunciation if I do get this wrong, Mutlatlo um, Mohawe, who is the DDG of Economic Planning from the Gauteng Department of Economic Development. So just that lovely combination and balance of the two discussions going super, followed by Mr. John Peters, who is from the Western Cape government and, and is the Chief Director of Economic Enablement, the Enablement, apologies there. So I think with the balance of these three discussions and looking at where we are at the moment in South Africa, what we need to do what we need to maintain and sustain at the moment, the discussions are going to be vital this morning. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what is on the cards. Um, 
And before I hand over to our wonderful facilitator, who will be taking us through the morning, Antonella de Kuna, who is the group risk manager from Cape Swan, but also the chairperson of our Western Cape Committee, and just the most unbelievable um, supporter and, and belief in terms of what risk management can do to um, really sustain an organization and build an organization. So we're so grateful for her for being here with, with us this morning. But before I hand over, I need to ask you a question in terms of what are you doing? So either as a, a small to medium um, business owner or a lead within that organization or a support within your role, which is supporting SMMEs or looking at what is your landscape in terms of what you are building? What is your next step? How are you going to step up? So our theme at Ermsler this year is step up. What is your next step? What are, what are you going to do? How are you going to make an impact yourself, not only within your organization or within the landscape of South Africa or with yourself personally? What are you going to be doing? And so it's something I speak about often is in terms of board exams, you know, in terms of making sure that you've got the right fit. So it's either with yourself or with someone in your team or part of your team or your whole team. Do your, do your risk champions and your risk professionals have the right credibility to support you? Do they have the correct designation? And so how will that be done? So UMSA has two board exams, which is the, the board exam one, which is the certified risk management practitioner, which is at an NQ of six level. Um, not it's, it's, you don't get the certification, but that is the level where our practitioners would sit. And then we have our serum prop, the, the certified risk management professional, which is at an NQF8 level with the designation. Um, both designations registered with the South African Qualifications Authority. And so the question is, do your people have that designation that leads to that credibility? Are you sure that that holistic world of risk management is well covered? And I think that is where you get that assurance for yourself or your organization or your team that we're on the right track with um, that credibility through the board exams. And the board exam is not just an exam. Um, yes, we write an exam and we go through it and you need to pass it and you need to pass the exams at a certain level, but it also works with work experience. And we ensure that we do the full work experience logbooks um, that, that meet that requirement. And so, you know, I think what is important to look at is number one, do you understand the criteria? You know, like a lot of people think, oh, I probably don't meet the criteria. I don't, you know, I'm probably not going to write the exam. But you'll be surprised because what UMS has done, and I think very well as well, is that we've looked at different routes throughout the board exams where we look at your risk management work experience and the number of years that will, you will need. So you don't necessarily need to have a formal degree qualification because I think one thing that we've understood is looking at the landscape is that, you know, not everyone has had the opportunity to, to have a tertiary um, degree over the years or studies. Um, or they've done different studies, or they've done a completely different degree, or a completely different um, diploma, and they've now fallen into risk management many years down the line. So we look at risk management experience versus different kinds of qualifications and degrees, or only risk experience. So currently, we have four different routes that will take you to the various, the two board exams. So how would you fit in there? And maybe it's worth a discussion with our team to see if you meet the criteria. The second thing is you might even be able to, you know, skip the, the first board exam because you might have sufficient experience to take you straight to board exam two. And I think that is something for you to look at that possibly you could apply for exemption and go straight up to board exam two. So there's quite a bit there for you to have a look at. And maybe it's time to consider that. And I think more and more, you know, we, we're looking at the work that the National School of Government is doing with the public sector in terms of professionalizing the public sector. And so, you know, obviously, what often what happens in the public sector will filter through to the private sector. And we are seeing more and more how that designation is becoming more and more important in terms of we're seeing the job adverts going out where they have to be a serum prep designation, which is the designation registered with UMSA through SACWA, or the serum prof, which is the second um, designation that I spoke to. And so now is the time to do that. And I think that's really important. The other important thing to note is our training for the year and something really exciting that we're launching in May is hybrid training. And, um, you know, we're hearing this word hybrid going around. It's the new word, you know, last year, the word that I found was new normal. And, um, and this year, the word is hybrid. 
So let me explain to you what our hybrid training is going to look like. It's really quite exciting. We're going to have our classroom training that links to online training where people can still sit all over the world, all over the country, in the comfort of their offices or home. But the way we will be doing it is that we will be filming the trainer and the class and having a very direct sort of link to that trainer. And we will have a host who will be the, the voice of the delegate at home and really engage and interact with our um, delegates at home and make sure that they are part of that class. So it's really going to be quite fun and a little bit different so that we just bring that energy back because I think we're all a little bit tired of our online training and a little bit tired of a lot of the online things and our team are just so innovative and creative that they've come up with the strategy to really bring a little bit of fun and engagement and that a breath of fresh air into these online um, events and training. And I think, um, so good luck to, the, to our team. You guys do amazing things and you showed off so much last year. So I know how you're going to show up this year. And so the Zoom platform is one of the, the beginning steps of us showing off, but it will grow and increase during the year because that is what the UMSA events marketing and training, training team do. They, they really know how to show up so well done. And then the last thing, of course, is our conference at the end of September to look forward to. Um, the team have got some amazing things up their sleeve in terms of also providing either a hybrid or a different kind of digital event as well this year. So something to look forward to and to diarize. Please get it into your diaries. So I am now going to hand over to Antonella. Um, Antonella, thank you so much. And, and so for those of you who don't know, she is the chair of the Western Cape Committee. She is from the Western Cape. But, it, but for the last few months, she's actually been based in Portugal. So Antonella, thank you so much. She wakes up super early for us often um, and, and makes sure that she's there and she's present and she's just available and then brings huge amounts of energy to us. And Antonella, thank you so much for being here as always. Uh, we're really looking forward to this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Bon dia. <laughs> Um, welcome, welcome everybody, and thank you, Gillian. Um, it's it's an only only a pleasure. We're one hour behind now, so at least I'm not getting up with the foxes, but maybe with a couple of sparrows. <laughs> um, okay, I want to welcome everybody again. I I believe we've got just under a hundred people this morning registered, so it's very very exciting. Um, the new Zoom platform will be excellent to manage our Q&A so you've got a place where you can put your questions. Um, uh, obviously we um, is managing the sound and the cameras so you people can be uh, can can be comfortable and have your noise background whether you type in your note or whatever it's fine because we won't hear you. About the 100 people that are registered, I want to thank each and every one of you for being present. What was interesting for me was to see that you're across from all sectors of the economy. But the interesting thing is that irrespective if you're a broker or a banker or an insurer or a solution provider or a government organization or a retailer or technology communication auditors, any other sector that you're from, in some time in your career, you will always engage on a professional basis with your um, with the SME. So they are integrate and integral to our business. It's so important, and that's why I think this um, this this opportunity this mo morning is not only about the SMEs, but it's the interaction and what is needed. Sorry about my hands. Um, I'm not Italian for, <laughs> I need to show up. Okay, um, Irmza is very committed to bringing new thought leadership and um, their guide, This I, I remind what uh, what uh, Gillian told us this morning, we live in, in a very uncertain landscape as business, whether we are corporate or, um, or uh, um, SMEs, we need to be prepared for the future. Again, I want to thank IGS Solutions. I love their motto, let us change your tomorrow, and that's what we're doing together. We need to be ready and changing for tomorrow. So we look forward to, um, for those of you that are interested in checking them out and using their amazing tool as an enabler. Okay, um, in the uh, startup of this presentation, there was a Winston Churchill um, uh, uh, um, comment that was made, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is courage to continue that counts. And certainly on, on a personal and on an SME uh, 
putting an SME hat on, you know, you have to continue to strive. I want to share a quick personal story before we jump into our wonderful new, um, uh, wonderful speakers that we have this morning that you've already had an intro, intro to. My husband spent three de decades in an SME um, enterprise. I've been always in corporate. And it, for me, it was very interesting to see that in those three decades, the risks and threats and weaknesses were always government regulatory compliances, lack of analytics, staff reliability, challenges of succession planning. The characteristics of an SME is vision and resilience. Those that make it are only about adaptability and courage and technology. So one last proverb, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. And for the SME, they need the most successful business um, solutions will enable them to prepare for tomorrow. And with that, I now want to welcome Diane Borman, who is the founder of Brand Analytics. She has an amazing um, uh, background. For, retired at 40 years, Diane, yet did 30 years of um, corporate entrepreneurial success story or 55,000 hours. That sounds like you've never really retired, have you? But you love what you do. So over to you. Welcome you and in and um, again to the to the audience. Any questions to Diane, you can put them up in your Q&A box. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Antonella. So everybody can hear me. I hope you can. If you can't, shout out because I can't see your questions right now. Well, I need to know who's here, who's in the house. Oh, do we have entrepreneurs, business owners, entrepreneurs, corporates? Let's put it into the chat so I can see who I'm talking to. And on that note, let's start. Stop. Stop talking about COVID. Stop using this as an excuse to fail. Stop all the noise, the white noise. What can you do about it anyway? Stop listening to the politics. South Africa, America, UK, EU, we're just overloaded with information right now. What's important for you and for your business? Stop innovating if you have not spoken to your clients. And how many of us have actually done that? So just stop. I want you to hear this. Stop. What of this information can you do anything about? What can you control? When you, in your business, are at the darkest dirtiest, dustiest times, I want you to add another little bit of pressure. I want you to add focus and relevance. Why? Why is that so important? We need to take you from that charcoal coal moment and put you forward as a diamond. We need to make sure that you're shining brightly out there. It's so important as business owners, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that we have a voice right now and we need to shout it from the rooftops, but only if we know that we are relevant and focused. So let's grow and let's grow together. Let's move our businesses forward with the help of one another. The new terminologies and the new way of doing things is about building each other together. I want you to remember this, and this is so important as we step into our future of 2021. Whenever there's chaos, chaos will bring change. Change will bring new, new leaders, new needs, and new clients. It's so important right now for you to remember that. So when was the last time that you actually picked up the telephone and asked your clients, what do they need? Are you still relevant? Are you still making that difference for them? How important is it for you to understand your clients right now? Do you know that the problem that they had at the beginning of 2020 has probably changed? So what problem or pleasure are you helping your clients with? And have you really identified what it is that they need not what it is that you want them to buy from you. So with new, with chaos and new leaders, new needs and new clients, where do you stand? Are you an industry leader right now? 
or are you just an industry follower? So remember, you have to stay focused and relevant in order to move forward. So let's look at three things today of how you can do that. Three things that will move your business forward. We have far too much information and I'm going to show you in a minute why. We probably do not understand our clients. And there are so many new opportunities out there, but which one is important for you right now? Which one will make your business move and grow and get to the next level? So during lockdown in the year 2020, which we'll all remember it dearly for, I'm sure, I worked with hundreds of business owners. And at the beginning of 2020, during the lockdown, um, I realized that in order for my business owner to continue growing, they had to stay relevant and most. We had to get them into an ecosystem where they were sharing ideas, not moaning, because that's easy for us to do, isn't it? So we added practical business knowledge so that they could make better business decisions, so that they could continue to remain focused and relevant. And every single one of them had an increase in clients, increase in sales, increase in profit, and a decrease in expenses. And we have statistics like 400% year on year, 200% month on month. They employed the most amount of staff that they've ever had, or they're relevant. Or they found their relevance. So working on your business is really, really important. And we don't understand and put enough emphasis on that. And I agree. It takes a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication to do that because we still need to jump into our business, into our departments, into our teams and make that work. But when you take a step back and look on the business that you're creating, it actually becomes more important right now. So let's look at the first element of what I'd mentioned, information. We are living in a world of an information overload where there's huge volumes, but very little quality. We have wasted time, too much opportunities, too many shiny, shiny objects, too much distractions. Our productivity is low. We will receive about 115 emails daily. And every three minutes and five seconds, your phone will buzz with some new WhatsApp, SMS or email. So looking at the world's average, the average is two hours and 25 minutes that the world sits on social media. Look what we do in South Africa, three hours and 32 minutes. The world average for using internet is 6 hours and 54 minutes. Where do we sit? 10 hours and six minutes. You cannot tell me that 10 hours on a daily basis, you sit investigating, searching, looking for new ideas, speaking to your customers, I guarantee you that your productivity is way lower than what you, what you know it is. So when was the last time that you actually switched off all the devices, that you had no connection to the internet, where you actually stood back and started to think about your relevance, the product offerings that you've got, who your clients are, when the last time it was that you phoned them, and whether what you're doing right now is really what you want to do. When did you work out what you are the expert of, what your business is doing different? Why are you unique? Do you know that every hour on the hour around the world, there's 11 thousand new businesses that are being created. So why choose you? Have you taken that time to actually work on your business? Have you done things like block out times when you look at emails or is your emails just coming up every second and you watching it and you waiting for the next client order to come through? Or do you take an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening? When was the last time that you wrote a letter, made a phone call, or did a chunky mail drop? 
Isn't it time that you started to do things different? Even going back to basics would help right now. It's really interesting when you start asking these questions to where business owners sit. So the second area that I want you to think about really importantly right now is your clients. Clients are normally divided into three areas, demographics, psychographics, and generations. So I took some time with my IT specialist and we came up with an algorithm. It's a set of questions that you get asked to determine who your customers are. And I can guarantee you that 90% of you sitting here today listening to this will have your clients wrong. Isn't that interesting? An amazing statistic. We have 7.9 billion people in the world and everybody will tell you that their clients are everybody. You cannot satisfy 7.9 billion people. You cannot. So you need to start becoming an expert of the space. You need to start understanding that you need to niche into a certain area of the clients. So which is your area? So let's look at these three elements, the demographics, psychographics, and generations. And let's see exactly where you sit right now of your understanding of your clients. Of course, demographics is the easiest one because this has been around since business started, hasn't it? This, is no, this used, to, used to be about 80% of what we did, but now it's gone down to 40%. You need to understand this and have a clear picture of who your client is, but it will only be 40% of your information on your, on your client. You need to know the age, the gender, the income, the education, and all those other demographic sides. But more importantly, you need to understand the psychographics, the why. The why they choose you and not somebody else. The emotion behind their choice. Your story, your business story, your team story, your story. People want to know. And then you need to understand generations. And I'm going to take a little bit longer in going through the generations right now with you so that you understand why I'm saying it's so important at this moment. The baby boomers and maturists have gone through a lot of crisis. So their, their mantra is adjust, adjust and manage. They've seen wars, social change, political change, terrorism and recessions. They are probably the most susceptible right now for this virus. And if they lost their jobs during this time, they would struggle to find a new job, specifically 5% of the increase of online shopping stems directly from this generation. So what are you doing for this generation right now? They've gone through recessions and therefore know that they've got to start looking at their financial situations. They have always and will struggle to keep up with their parents financially, but they are prepared for social distancing because they come from a generation where two parents worked and therefore had to occupy themselves through DIY, hobbies, etc. So what are you doing for this generation? The millennials or the Gen Ys, everybody talks about and everybody wants them as their client. But did you know that this is the generation that's probably the least productive during um, remote working, during working from home? They have a concern about their parents and their children, and they've been juggling homeschooling and work work that out because their whole intention is working with teams. They want to be part of an ecosystem. The Gen Zs are probably the most affected right now because they are in the area in their lives of social and economical development and professional development. What does that mean? That means that the word social distancing should never have been part of our vocabulary. It should have been physical distancing because right now they have emotional and financial setback in this generation and probably will be the generation that has the highest PTSD from, from this whole lockdown scenario. They would also be in the generation that had the highest layoffs because they would have worked either permanently or um, part-time 
for retail, tourism, and hospitality industries. And right now are the generation that's feeling the least connected. So with that information, what are you doing for them? What have you done for them in this whole year that we've been going through this terrible phase of lockdown? So understanding your clients is so important because you cannot understand your clients and grab on opportunities if you're not making sure that the opportunities relate back to who your clients are. At the beginning of 2020, we have a diamond theory of relevant advantage. And most of my clients and you here today would have probably scored an eight or a nine out of 10. But I bet you, if you took the same um, test that we have, you would be a two or a three right now. So isn't it time that you really started working on your business? What we never, ever, ever do is look at the numbers. Most business owners shy away from those numbers. We look at how much money is in the bank. But it's now time to actually sit and work out where are you growing? Because you can still be growing in certain areas. But are you growing in the right spaces? Not only sales, but profit as well. The numbers people will run away from. But it's now time. It's now time to actually sit down and put your graphs together and work out exactly what it is that you need to do and whether you now need to look for new opportunities. So let's look at what opportunities are there? Are there anything for you or for anybody else out there? And remember pushing yourself out of your comfort zone doesn't mean to say that everybody else is not doing exactly the same thing. So escape from the city. We are so lucky to be in a space where we can work online, like today, Teams, Zoom, etc. So it's easier to move to the country. Open spaces, growing your own veggies, the anti nine to five jobs and companies are really encouraging this in so many areas. It has helped to increase family time, increase travel around our own country. Did you know that Spotify has actually given their staff $1,000 to set up a home office. So what are you doing to help escape from the cities? Nights in or nights out with, with friends have become nights in with family. Family has dynamics have become so important. But things like puzzles and board games have also. So does your business have something that can add to that? Hobbies, oh my goodness, when was the last time that you actually looked at what hobbies you love to do? The Gen Xs are the ones that understand hobbies, but the, Gen the millennials and the Gen Ys, they didn't know about hobbies until now. Because we spend money on things like theater, movies, concerts, and petrol. That money has now gone to create hobbies. Hobbies and DIY. So with that in mind, what have you done for these new trends? Home cooking. Didn't we all have to do our own home cooking up until a little while ago? But therein lies another opportunity because we've realized, or a lot of people have realized, that they don't have to go to restaurants anymore to enjoy a meal. The Gen Ys have even started enjoying cooking and understanding how to do it to make it more healthy for them. But those boxes of ingredients and new ways of cooking has now become quite a trend. So are you helping in that area? Walking and cycling. Even News 24 has a section on cycling now. Isn't that interesting? So people are cycling and walking more and therefore understanding their community even more. So they act their own home base. Whereas going by car, bus and um and train has decreased dramatically. The mental health versus pandemic has become quite a topic and will be for a number of years to come. But things, companies have gone into an area of creating different programs. For example, uh, fitness and health and mental health all of these have become into a program that most companies are offering, but they are adding things like meal delivery vouchers. So Uber Eats is increasing dramatically and working from home snack boxes, any way to help the person or their staff 
working from home is so important now for every single business. So understanding that we are now helping to support people. Yes, we all knew about CSI before COVID hit us, but now we really are taking it another step further. The community and the people, but it's not only about our social responsibility, it's also about instant entrepreneurs. There are now companies that are helping with funding, with launch companies, with innovation companies. So you can become an immediate entrepreneur, not going through the pain that a lot of people have gone through. Eco-friendly, of course, we're walking around, we're cycling around, we can see the damage that has been caused to our planet. So eco-friendly becomes more and more and more important right now. And value. Of course, in a business, what value are you adding to your clients? And for those of you that know me, I will always be speaking about this. What targeted offerings do you have? Do you have things like subscriptions or memberships? And a lot of businesses are now doing recommendations so that their clients have a simplified purchase opportunity and therefore become focused. The next new trends are, you will have noticed that during lockdown, people are talking about the business or the brand. And it's all about the why. Why do you have a business? What is your brand's purpose? Tell me that story become so important. But what brands have done and businesses have done is they've started to increase the level of education and therefore helping their customer with personal development so that they are encouraging their customer to keep growing. Live streaming and e-commerce has definitely gone completely wild right now. But it's so interesting because you can go online and you can purchase a jacket or a pants or anything really online. But a lot of people don't know how to mix and match it. And that's the live streaming side that they're starting to put videos on to show you exactly what to do and actually make it fun. So it's no, no longer that boring moment of going on and selecting a, a t-shirt and that's it. There's a whole story behind it with fun and education. Gamification is most certainly where a lot of businesses are moving towards. So even Walmart has a Walmart city online. It's a virtual city where they train their staff on what they should be doing and how they should be doing it. And the last trend that I want to mention today is collaboration. How do you make your circle bigger, quicker? Collaboration, of course, who has your target audience that's not doing what you're doing right now? How can you link with them? How can you form partnerships, JVs, these affiliates? There's so many things that you could be doing right now to make your circle bigger. It's now time to step out from that moment of not wanting to share. We've been in that space for far too long right now. It's now time for you to start making your circle bigger and a quicker. So I did start off by saying that there were two areas I want you to remember and I want you to really look at which is focus and relevance. So if you looked at what we've spoken about, what are you doing with the information that you're getting? When are you looking at information? Is it too much out there? It, so don't look at it. Are you looking at your clients and understanding exactly who they are and what they're doing and what their needs are and what they want from you and why they're purchasing from you? And then what are the new opportunities that you can find right now? Because there are so many out there. You've got to work out what's right for you. So if you're wanting to really, really grow and take this business part really serious, you need to become focused and relevant. But you're also welcome and have your phones ready because I'm going to share my website with you in the next slide. If you want to have a look and have me send you the um, spreadsheet on how to work out exactly who your clients are, then drop me an email. Drop me a link to my Calendly request, but only in May, please, because I'm going on holiday this month. So join me and let's have a 30-minute discussion on where you are in your business, whether you own your own business, your entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter. We still all need it. So here it comes. Here's my website. Go on there. There's also a 58 facets of a diamond um, ebook for you. It's free. 
It just helps you streamline what it is that you have been doing and what you can be doing within your business and what you should be doing because we forget a lot of those moments. Um, so just as we move forward, here is my website. So don't think that you're the only person that had to step up. I stepped up into professional speaking last year and spoke to over a million people in, in four continents. Push yourself out of your comfort zones. It's the most amazing moment to find yourself successful. And we are all able to be that successful. My name is Diane Borman, and I look forward to talking to some of you in the not too distant future about business growth, about stepping up, about making sure that your business grows, the economy grows, so that we can be there to support and help each other. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Diane. That was so insightful, such a good perspective, back to basics, understanding the trends, the generations, how to grow our businesses. You've given us so many nice, sweet, easy points to refer to and your website and your contact. I see there's no questions. It's because you've been so comprehensive in your, <laughs> in your, in your presentation. You're now a very professional presenter because you've done it so often. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think I, I just want to say one thing, you know, there's a, a Chinese proverb that says a bad workman blames his tools. And I go back to what you said at the beginning. It's so it was so easy with COVID to say because of COVID, I don't have a business because of COVID. I don't, I've lost my house because of COVID. I, 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 I. Um, instead of making excuses and blaming someone else, we need to uh, take ownership and learn from those experiences. And that's the only way forward. There isn't anything else. Um, and in that taking ownership, it's changing things because as you say, chaos is part of our, our environment. So thank you very much. Have a great holiday. We will only pester you in May, reminding the audience. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, we look forward to seeing you again sometime on Unza. And now ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Pleasure. It's time to um, introduce um, John Peters from the Western Cape government. Um, we, uh, 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 um, Julian has given us a little bit of introduction. He has a very rich background in economic development of the province and is very established in most extensive business support network in South Africa. And what I found interesting with him and with what Diane was saying, you know, she spoke about collaboration and that talks to network. Without networks and without collaboration, you are not um, possible. Your, your business is limited. Let's put it that way. So I hand you over to John Peters. I don't see him. Um, Umza, there we are. Good morning, good morning and welcome. Hi, good morning, Antonel. Thank you very much and welcome to all the delegates. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's the second time, so it's really been good. For the, for the first time, I think I enjoyed it. Um, so, uh, yeah, look, what I would just like to do is um, just flash the presentation first. Um, uh, Sorry, can you just enable the, the screen sharing? I sorry, Antonel, can you hear me? Um, I can hear you. Um, I think um, Kerbis should be able to do that because I don't think I can do it. Uh, Antonel, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? I, yes, I can, I can hear, hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I can see the screen, but it's been disabled. John, I've allowed it now. Please try. Oh, okay.
You just tell me if I'm sharing. Yes. Okay. We all sit. Yes, thank you. Okay, right. Look, the, 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 the previous topic that I had when I was invited was basically to look at um, the problems facing SMMEs in the, in the first two years of, of establishment. So what, what I chose and, and, and part of the recommendation was to do something on the, on the impact of, 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 um, of, of COVID-19 on, on SMMEs. Uh, but I think importantly, how do we actually take things forward? So a lot has been written. So what I tried to do was to distill the essentials and almost the, the trends or patterns that have, that, have, that have come through all of these, rec these, these recommendations. So, um, sorry. So is the screen moving? No. Um, okay. Let us try now. Okay. Um, so, so let's just first look at at that at that uh, importance of, of SMMEs as an economic driver. And I think it's important to understand this is a context. So, the first of all, it's um, it's uh, what it's, it's a, con a key contribute to economic growth and employment. Um, secondly, it's an entry point for many of the working age population into the economy, especially from your from your previously disadvantaged uh, areas. Also, you find that the labor absorptive capacity is generally higher than in corporates. So by basically saying that you get uh, easier labor absorption from an SME compared to a corporate, the average cost per job is low compared to a corporate. And, and in many cases, it provides a sustainable livelihood for those who are excluded from the formal economy. I think overseas and, and to a limited extent, and that's what the problem that we might have in South Africa is that it can be a source of innovation of new ideas of how we actually take things forward. It increases efficiency in supply chains. What we're finding is that more and more SMEs are coming to the port and increasing the, 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 the nimbleness of supply chains and the, and the, and the, and the quickness and the swiftness of, 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 uh, of our ability to, to respond to, to, to change in demand. It's economic resilience and stimulation. SMEs change all the time, so they, they're more resilient to, to economic shocks. And it's a stepping stone to the formal business sector. For many SMMEs or for many uh, uh, informal SMMEs, being part of the, of the informal sector is a stepping stone to become a formal business. And obviously it addresses inequality in terms of, in terms of uh, poverty and also in terms of income. Um, okay, so if we just look at the, the, the share of SMMEs in, in, in South Africa. Now I've circled the, the, the South Africa statistic compared to the G2 and then also to the, to the EU. And what we find is that we've, our contribution to private sector jobs is 25.8% and the share of the GDP is 39.39%. 30, if you compare that to the EU and to the G2 countries, you find there that there's a big difference, right? Now, the, 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 the further concern about this is that the NDP puts the target of new employment rate contributed by SMMEs to 90%, right? It also says that we need to have SMMEs contribute 60 to 80% to GDP. Now, if you look at those current figures and what we're planning to do, we tend to be quite far off on that one. So um, let's, let's look at then some high level findings of the small business project, right? In that formal, formal employing SMEs is much smaller than the original thought, consisting only of 250 SMEs, 250 businesses, far off the original mark. So there's been this sort of perception that there's thousands, if not millions of SMEs. But what this project has found, or this particular uh, um, research has found, that we only have actually 250,000 businesses, okay, that, that employ people, right? Okay, while SMEs contribute to 98% of the formal firms in the economy, they only account for 28% of the jobs. Now, 
based on the international trend, this should be 60 to 70%, right? So what we find is that although we have a high contribution of, of, of SMEs in terms of the formal in terms of the formal firms in the economy, only 28% of the they only create 28% of the jobs. The majority or 58, 56% of jobs in this come from about a thousand large employees. So it's not as if the employment is being spread across thousands of SMEs, right? Which again is a is a, is a risk when it comes to certain certain shocks. Right? Also um, smaller, small firms pay more to retain staff than larger firms as a percentage of turnover, but not employing people at a desirable rate. So what we find in, is that we need to get our smaller firms to employ at a better rate compared to your corporates if you want to actually grow the sector. Right. Here's some research that has been done, and 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 let's and I think the emphasis here is pre-COVID, right? Um, MoneyWeb did us, uh, some research during the 15 years and found that 78% of small businesses fail within five years. And about 1% of micro businesses that started with less than five employees have grown to employ 10 people or more. So, so what we find is that we've got a high failure rate of existing businesses, but then also the micro businesses in this case that have grown, only 1% have grown from five employees to 10 employees. Again, this problem of not being able to absorb, also, uh, absorb employment or unemployment uh, adequately, right? So there's another statistic that was done by the Department of Small Business Development, where they found in uh, the 37 percent of those that were sort of served in, in, in 2014 survived to their fourth year. By the 10 year mark, only 9 percent were still hanging in there, right? Again, pointing to the low rate. Then if we look at what is called the GEM report, so it's, it's 2019. The established business rate of 3.5 percent is far below the African region and the developing countries. Now, the established business rate is is worked at as a percentage where they take the percentage of the adult population between 15 and 64 that actually own a business or involved in a business. And we have a rate of 3.5%, which is quite low compared to other African countries. Right? What we also have as a, as a disadvantage is that our business exit rate at 4.9% is higher than the established rate. So you actually get in more people discontinuing their business for various reasons than actually starting business or remaining in business. Okay, so let's look at some of the forecasts and the statistics of the, uh, when we look at the, the COVID issue, right? So first of all, in macro, it's talking in a macro sense that the economy contract about 7% 7, 7 in 2020, this was been in a historic decline. I mean, it's mirrored by the by international or global, uh, or global uh, stats. stats. The real GDP recovery mountains slowed down notably in, 20, in 2020, quarter four, right? Overall, the SA GDP is said to lag the rest of the world as domestic demand takes longer to recuperate. Now, obviously, this is going to have an impact on business, but specifically on SMEs, right? Uh, there's an improved debt trajectory. We'll see government trying to consolidate debt, but, but our risk still remains. And again, we look based in this all on our, our uh, assumptions with regard to revenue collection. Okay, um, <coughs> load shedding obviously remains a, a key downside to GDP risk. Um, we find our business are starting to recover, but again, soon being hamstrung by, 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 by load shedding. The fiscal, fiscal outlook is precarious with regard to the credit ratings. Now, again, this can affect the monetary policy, it can affect your, 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 your interest rates, which can then obviously impact your, your SMMEs. Our employment picture looks bleak. Again, global is very similar. Uh, 2020 quarter four, we had a 32% unemployment rate, which translates to about 7.2 million people. The the added sort of um, knock to this is that we have a very high youth unemployment risk. Right? Okay. Tourism has recovered, which has been the main uh, mainstay of, of, of our economy, especially in the Western Cape, but remain 80% down from levels a year ago. Example. Accommodation decline from 25.3 billion rand to 9.8 billion rand. And at the moment now, accommodation and tourist related activities are largely limited to your to your local accommodate uh, tourism, right? The business confidence in terms of our business feels looking forward also declined in in, in the in the first quarter of 2021. <laughs> okay. Let's just look at some of the statistics that came out uh, quarter three, and this is the latest statistics done by CEDA with regard to SMME. 
Level percent decline in SMEs about 290,000 year on year. So from 2.6 million to 2.36, uh, 2.65 million to 2.36 million. So it's quite a huge decline with regard to that. 90% of jobs lost in the economy within the SMME sector. So a decimated jobs in the SME sector, right? So the so SME employment contracted in about 1.5 in the year 2020 quarter three. The total employment provided by SMEs declined by 14% between the third quarter in 2019 and the third, third quarter in, 23, in, in 2020 to 10.1 million. Okay, so what has been the support to SMMEs during COVID-19? So there was a whole host or raft of support measures that were introduced by government. Now, largely introduced by government, but the component was also done uh, uh, via a partnership with the, with the private sector. Here's just some of the, or, or, or quite a few of the of the support measures that actually were introduced. First of all, there was that subsidy of five rand per, 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 per employee who was earning six, less than six and a half thousand rand a month. There was acceleration in terms of the payment of employment tax uh, incentive benefits, the, the National Disaster Benefit Scheme. And then obviously it was a delay of pay, PAY payments uh, with, with <coughs> uh, 50, 50 million rand turnover. In terms of the labor market, there was the TERS uh, program Okay, which which sort of paid out temporary unemployment benefits to to, to workers, um, the solidarity fund and then the compensation fund. So specifically in terms of business support, right? We had a three billion rand industrial funding by IDC and the DTI. It was a two million land assistance to SMEs in tourism and hospitality sectors. The suspension of the UIF contributions, the exemption exemption of banks with the, with regard to the Competition Act to enable coordinated response. So banks would actually cooperate in terms of providing support. There was a loan guarantee scheme that was administered by uh, to CIFA and then also by the by 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 banks through through to national treasury. There was a debt relief fund and business resilience uh, resilience facility also done by 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 CIFA, and then also all CIFA or CIFA funded loans were, were restructured. And then for agriculture, there was the agriculture disaster fund. And then for the for 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 SPASA or for township based SMEs, there was the SPASA support program. The, what, what, what you found was that despite the host of support to SMMEs, right, especially to your informal businesses, you, you, you didn't actually find the take up that was that you thought it would actually have, right? So a, again, there's a couple of reasons for that. One being the, the, the conditions were just too onerous, right? So example, provide me uh, 12 months financial statements. I mean, SMEs just couldn't maybe do that. Um, upload things online. SMEs just couldn't do those things. Um, uh, show me your 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 tax clearance. SMEs couldn't do that. So despite all these measures put on the table, the ability of SMEs to access the support hasn't been too 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 good, right? Okay. Um, Right. So, so what has been the, the, the impact of, of, of COVID-19? And here I'd like to, to, to actually look at maybe what has been the impact on, on, on our SMMEs, but then also on livelihoods. And, and I think the important thing to note here is to ask ourselves, what is going to be the long-term impact on this? And how do we reposition ourselves, not only as government, but also as the private sector? So this, this was done by uh, a, um, a consultancy, consultancy called Beyond COVID Business Survey. Now, you will know that there's, there's quite a, there's a host of surveys that were done. So what I tried to do was to take one, which, which, which number one, had a, a relatively large uh, sample, in this case, four and a half thousand, and then also that straddled the 2020 and then also 2021. So you get like a good snapshot of, of that sort of a really bad period and then a not so bad period. Some of the surveys tend to be in the real bad period. In other words, from say from March 2020 to August 2020, when we were really in a bad period. So that gives a bit of a distorted view. So I chose this one. Uh, like I said, it's, it's four and a half thousand businesses with 50% being more than 50% being micro to small business. So it gives you again a good feel of, 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 of the sector, right? So here's some of the snapshots of the findings. Number one, 20% of the businesses polled were or closed, right? Although 64% indicated they would reopen. 54% currently operating below capacity, right? So they can sell a thousand, they're only selling 200, right? 
41% planning to retrain staff. That's, that's about 1.2 million people over the next six months, okay? Which again is, 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 is quite concerning. Okay, uh, obviously the, 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 the sectors most affected were construction, accommodation and food, manufacturing, ICT, right, were the worst affected. A third expressed the need for funding over the six, six months period, it was just to tie them over in terms of cash flow problems. The business expected recovery to pre-COVID-19 levels to take 3.5 years, right, so it's, it's going to be a little bit of a long, long hard slog to actually recover to, to, to pre-COVID uh, numbers, right. Businesses that are cash positive are now are now 5% up from 2% at the start of the pandemic. So there's very little that is, that, is, that is cash positive, but there's been a slight increase in that one, right? The number of business with staff working from home has dropped from 74% to 57%, right? Like I say, if we had taken this in, in, in 2020, this figure would have been far higher, but now we're getting a more balanced figure or balanced idea of, of when it was at its height, 74%, and now things are starting to normalize. It is such a term that we can use, it's now 50, 57%. However, uh, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is quite interesting is that, and I think it's expected, is up to 64% indicate their willingness to allow staff to work from home post the, post the pandemic. Now, the, obviously, this has severe repercussions for, 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 for inner city businesses. Because it means I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in, the, in, in the CBD and in a little strip called um, St. George's Mall, just between one block, I already counted about 10 businesses that have closed, including a KFC. You know, I mean, if a, if a KFC closes, I mean, there's a problem, which is simply as a result of staff or people not coming to work often working most of the time from home, which is affected in, in, in these businesses. Now, I mean, we are of thought that, you know, things would turn, return to normal, but clearly 64% of these businesses are showing or saying that, look, we might just continue working like this. And again, this will have repercussions on the construction industry because now less office space is required. I mean, how, how, how do they deal with that one, right? Okay. Um, let's see. Um, just this one. Okay, right, then if we look at, and I think this is a quite an interesting one in that, let's look at the, how it has affected the, 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 the most vulnerable in our society. Now, I'm always looking at it in terms of, if we do not deal with the inequality, no matter how high your fences are, it will spill over. So not only is it the right thing to do, but if we want to secure a future for all of us, we need to be looking at this as an important component, right? So this is quite a good study that was done and it was done in, a, in, in, in Kailicha. Um, what I liked about it, it was, a, it was qualitative research. Okay, so it took Kailicha as a, as a sort of good sample of, of, your, of your typical township or disadvantaged area and did a, a but not only the quantitative part, but also the qualitative uh, component to it, which I think adds richness to it and gives you some sort of feeling of what is actually what is happening, right? Um, this uh, SA, the TID is a collaboration between local and international researchers and the, and the, SA, and the SA government, right? Just look, let's look at the, the three components of this, right? The first one, economic losses in the labor market. Now, obviously those in the former wage market was affected. Right, so so I live in Kailicha and I work at a construction company. I get a, and I get I work formally and I get a formal wage, which is whatever five thousand rand, um, because of the lockdown. I just uh, I didn't get any salary or I get re got a reduced salary. However, as expected, that that informal work were much more exposed to these shocks. Right, primarily due to the lockdown regulation. So certain spaza shops couldn't operate, so they had to shut down. Right? There was challenges in transport, so I can't actually go and, 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 and go to town and sell my wares at the, at the station or, at the, or in the street, I mean, because there was no transport. I couldn't procure stock because there was lockdowns and we just didn't have enough money. In addition to that, the link between the formal and the informal sector is important in that that, that workers that I used to target of the formal sector, uh, the, the, the workers traveling to train, the traveling by train where I would sell my wares on the train. They just weren't there anymore because there was no trains operating. So that link between the formal and the informal had an impact there, which, which 
eventually affected the, 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 the informal uh, person, right? So there were severe economic losses in, the, in that labor market. Amplified vulnerabilities, risk factors and resilience, right? So what we found was that, that the households with limited assets ran down their savings and defaulted on insurance payments, right? Such as uh, 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 um, life insurance and, and, and funeral policies, leaving them even more vulnerable to future economic shocks. So they were already vulnerable. COVID hit. They had to start digging into their whatever savings they had um, for consumption, and, and, and now they're even more vulnerable to, to additional shocks, shocks. Additional shocks in terms of a second wave, a third wave, and then obviously the, 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 the company uh, regulations or lockdown regulations. The school closures, now this is an important one, the school closures pose a double burden, food insecurity and learning. Now, food insecurity meaning that for quite a few of these scholars or quite a few of these households, the school provides almost maybe the only meal for the day for those kids. So because schools were closed, there was a, there was a food insecurity issue. Not only that, there was also a learning component that has been affected there, which at the end of the day would affect that person's ability to become upwardly mobile, to get an education and to pre pre improve his or her uh, um, economic lot, right? Then new, new risk factors arose. Example, new informal settlements mushroomed. Now, where I live, I'm very close to a place called, um, called the Noon. And within, I mean, I drive often past, within three months, there was literally a thousand or more informal dwellings that actually just just developed from on 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 a, on a specific area of of the noon so that has not only been happening the noon it has been happening all over the city of uh, city of cape town now now it's all different different reasons for that first one it was some people just sort of taking advantage of a situation that you know they could move others is where backyard dwellers because they were unemployed <clears throat> They were simply put out and they had no other place to go but to actually establish a, 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 a new sort of dwelling for themselves and where else do they go but vacant land. The other part, which is also the, the concerning part, is the, the psychological distress in the context of vulnerability and uncertainty. Now, 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 now this is something which, again, when you, when you look at people who are unemployed, that, that worrying component of unemployed people are not the ones between jobs but the ones that have given up hope of finding a job. Now, those are the ones that become desperate and becomes not only a threat to themselves, but a threat to society, okay? So, so the fear of the virus and the loss of opportunities to generate income and school closure. So, so here was a double part to it, right? First of all, for the older folk, it was a matter of the health. I mean, if I get sick as an older person, I mean, there's a great chance that I will die because I don't have access to decent medical aid and to medical support, right? There was that one. For the for the younger lot, it was, you know what, I, this is not really going to affect me, but it will affect my opportunity to generate an income, right? And so obviously, and also obviously the, 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 the resultant or other part that comes there, it would be the what would be the school closures. So so there was a double whammy in terms of the older sort of uh, uh, um, inhabitant or, or citizen of, of, of these areas worrying about the, 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 the health. And then for the younger lot, it was a matter of worrying about the econ economic well-being. So this is all sort of created additional stress. So if, if we felt as, 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 as sort of formal wage or salary earning people, the stress of COVID, I think we must multiply that by a thousand to people living in, in, in these various areas. And then sort of, uh, they may, may be aligned to that one, the rise in domestic violence. You have, so you have a small small sort of household in terms of in terms of square meterage, both husband and wife are at home, the, the frustration start boiling over because it might not be any income, um, the difficulty in accessing online sort of platforms for the school and stuff like that. So what, what has been found, and, good, and this happens all over the world, there's been a rise in, in, in actual domestic violence. So I think the the the, the the, 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 I want to look at the core of it is that the long-term impact of this sort of shock to the to the to the to the to the, to the almost um, most vulnerable in our society has been has been has been very very concerning, right? Okay, so so what were some of the recommendations? Now, here again, if you you go to the internet, you'll find there's a 
lots of recommendations by quite a few people that that that's some, some of it is is, is quite uh, uh, micro and others uh, macro um, and also sort of generic what i try to do was to just pull out some of the recommendations by by people that are practical you know so what i chose here is by there was a there was a panel of experts convened by the city press and it was headed by a carl westwig of the ceo of the retail capital it was colin timmers jonathan smith and Aidan Yan. Um, so, so they were asked, look, what, 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 what recommendations do you, do you actually have with regard to, 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 to how we take these things forward in the context of COVID and the context of uncertainty, right? So the first one is non-banks, another lifeline, do more for SMEs to access non-bank lenders. I think, you know, we have, we have mainstream banking. And, and SMEs aren't really accessing that. But even more concerning is that the non-bank lenders, such as government uh, agencies, SMEs are also not accessing them. Now, there's various reasons for that. Uh, uh, number one, I don't want to show myself up because if I show myself up and then I'll be considered for tax and I don't want to do that. Secondly, the requirements might be onerous. I don't have bank statements. So, I mean, I'm not going to access it, right? So that I think question uh, issue there is, how do non-banks come better to the party, right? Mainstream funding requirements don't work for SMEs. Now, now this has been said over and over. It's no use putting in conditions for support to SMEs in terms of loans when it's based on your mainstream collateral-based lending. I've got collateral, I've got a, a, a house, so if I make a loan, the bank will simply tell me, okay, fine, what's the value of your, of your, of your house? Um, right, we'll lend against that. Most SMMEs or SMME owners don't have that collateral. So if, if the requirement's collateral, what are the chances of them actually being successful in getting that access, right? Um, take a seat at the table and prove this eco-support system. This is something which we all need to come to the party and take a seat at the table. Uh, the, the, uh, the experts talk about a, a support ecosystem. That's how is private sector with, with opportunities such as with government, uh, training, uh, uh, mentorship. How are we all sitting around the table to address this problem? Or are we seeing it only as a government problem? I mean, that, that's wrong. We need to see it as a societal problem. How are we all contributing to it? Billions unspent for SMMEs. Um, like I said previously, despite all the billions at, sort of put to the disposal of SMEs, this has gone unspent simply because the requirements are, are unrealistic, right? Take off the commercial ad, private sector to come to the part and it ties into the, in, into, the, into the third point there. If private sector is going to say this is a government problem, government needs to sort it out, I don't think we're going to be very successful with regard to that one, okay? Um, right. Uh, your 30 days is up, still an issue for SMMEs, private and public sectors. I mean, we recently had a report of, of specifically government in some of the provinces where, where billions are still owed to SMMEs, more than 30 days for, for, for services rendered. Now, this is not only in, 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 the, in the public sector context, but also in the private sector. Um, uh, within, our, within our department, we have, we have the Red Tape Reduction Unit or the Ease of Doing Business Unit, and quite a few concerns seem to be um, the corporate is taking lo too long to pay me. Um, they, 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 they drag it out the payment. Um, it's more than 30 days. Who do I go to? At least with government, you can, you can write to the premier, you can write to the president, you can call the hotline. But with, a, with, with private sector, I mean, if I moan too much, will I get work tomorrow? So, so rather keep quiet and, and moan, moan, moan quietly, right? This was a very interesting one, is um, fast track, uh, track the taxi regulation. Um, the, the, the feeling here of the panel is that it will make significant difference to tax revenue. And this is what we actually, we need to broaden the tax base. And by tapping into that taxi industry and almost, I want to call it, might be almost impossible, but formalizing that, we'll be able to, we may be able to extract some revenue in terms of, um, in terms of tax collection, right? And then time to take up both government and SMMEs. And I think here the emphasis was, three, two, two emphasis here was the first one is that government talks about going digital and making it easier to do business. What is government doing to make it easier for me to access its services 
and to access whatever support is available, okay? Uh, to what extent are applications online, making it far more expedient to, 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 to actually deliver these services. The other important part there is that what we found was that the, 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 the COVID-19 sort of exposed our SMMEs and whether they were previously disadvantaged SMMEs or your mainstream, on a calling with normal SMMEs, that the uptake of, of, of tech was severely lagging. And if we see how, how the world is moving, if this is not shocked sort of uh, uh, businesses into realizing that, that, that the tech, is, tech part is going to be very important, I don't think they'll be able, be able to survive a, 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 a wave, which is going to be, which is still going to be even more, I would say, technology driven, right? Um, actually very interesting. <coughs> Um, I, I, I convene a panel of, 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 um, of uh, um, business chambers and at the initial sort of when COVID just hit, there was about five organizations where their representatives had absolutely no access to any, any tech platform. Tech platform meaning whether it's a Zoom or whether it was a, a, a Teams or any sort of platform to engage with each other. And, and that was quite quite concerning and because just they just never prepared for it. And, and again, if you if you if you if you if you if I go back, I mean I think out of those five, <clears throat> three have now decided, okay, they need to go this way. The two have still said, look, uh, they, they they'll think about it and they'll actually take it up. So in a nutshell, I think just to just to maybe to 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 come to a conclusion, the 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 COVID nineteen has been a good example of a sudden shock that has really shaken the structure. Okay, that has not only exposed the deep divides in terms of inequality, the 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 the, the levels of preparedness, the 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 um, the ability to be nimble to adapt. Okay. But I think far more important is the long-term effect that this will have on, on business and then also society. And then it begs the question from ourselves, the, 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 the ones that supposedly know more, have more access to information, sort of have got a better idea of where the world is moving. How are we banding together instead of apportioning responsibility and saying this is government's responsibility, this is the private sector's response, it's all our collective responsibility. So how do we actually work together and overcome this uh, 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 um, situation that we find ourselves in this dilemma and also be able to take on any future challenges that might present ourselves. Thank you very much. Hello? Hello? Thank you, John. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, technology is getting the best, better of us. Yeah. Thank you. That was very insightful, a very interesting, um, giving us the, the um, <coughs> information, the content and highlighting to us the, um, the landscape, isn't it? And the context of where South Africa is versus the rest of the world. And certainly it, it beckons some questions, et cetera. So we've had quite a few questions in the comment section. Our chat box isn't really working. So I'm afraid um, there was nothing for Diane, but there's a lot for you. <laughs> so I hope you're ready to face the music. <laughs> okay. Um, so you touched on the tech issue and the fact that um, the take up in South Africa is so very, very low. And my personal observation is that everybody and anybody's got a cell phone, okay? And if I am now sitting in Europe at the moment, and if I look at the most um, un, uh, I don't want to say uneducated, but the lowest of class, they've all got cell phones, and they're getting their self, they're getting their collect your your uh, your your. Um, your pension, collect your your uh, your parcel of uh, of household goods. Please present yourself for a COVID testing on their cell phones. So the question to you is: If literacy was the old measure in the old days, 
why have we not put the new measure on the table, tech? You know, surely technology should be a government, a business, a South Africa priority, because as you've highlighted, without of it, you can't go online, you can't go um, and do anything, you can't even go to the shop now, I mean, soon we won't be able to pay anything in cash, you're going to need to do it with cards, that means it's going to be tech. So yeah, that's the first question, I'm, I'm going to stop and let you, um, I won't give you all of them, otherwise I think you'll run away. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think from from I can talk from maybe not representing yeah, representing government to an extent, but I mean this is my, my, my personal opinion. I think obviously the the um, this the COVID nineteen caught us totally unaware, right? I mean, uh, we thought it was going to be a little bit worse than a flu, and it turned out to be much more than that. Um, I think in our even when we started with this, this with a tech issue, I don't think there was enough push from government. Also, we didn't really understand the real implications of tech, because what we saw was, if you look at the informal sector, you know, ugh, what's the use? I mean, they don't need tech. All they need to do is to be able to sell stuff, and it's all it's all going to be physical and stuff like that. There are little businesses that can go that can go can go online in terms of tourist things like booking and. And little gifts and stuff like that, but by and large, that's not going to that's not going to be driving the economy. So I think we were a little bit ill prepared for putting certain things in place. But I think also on the other end, such things such as access to tech uh, in terms of in terms of cheap enough broadband, that is something that that we all need to work on. I mean, in in in, the, in, in some of the African countries, broadband is, is cheap, so it's the access is easier. You you, you can't have a situation where data is expensive. I mean, so so what's absolutely, that? yeah. So so that's I think, and again, that is something which is not only government's problem; it's also the private sector's problem. How we how are we come into the party then as the as the as the private sector to assist in that thing? So I think it's two parts. Well, yes, I think we were caught a bit flat-footed. I don't know if we're moving fast enough. Certainly, what we've been doing in the Western Cape, we just now funded about four five about five incubators that will be focusing on tech. You know, so and then these and these incubators are in the township. So sort of getting into those townships and almost leapfrogging instead of saying, you know what, let's just build these businesses first up to a certain mainstream level and then we go tech. Now we say no, let's go in with mm -hmm. tech and start almost immediately. So that's the one thing. Then I think almost cheaper broadband. And then I think how do we how do we get our 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 our, our educational institutions, whether it's our schools or our colleges to almost make this integral to education so that when a kid finishes school, whenever he finishes school, whether it's matric or finishes college, that idea of tech is already imprinted. Instead of saying, okay, fine, we're not going to, we're not going to teach you tech at the university or we're going to, no, no, no. How does that become part of, 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 of development of a kid? You know, like our kids are fortunate enough to sit at a young age with an iPad. How many? kids in the townships at the ECDs have ever seen an iPad you know so, yeah. so how have they been exposed to text so I think we there's a huge challenge there there's a huge opportunity isn't there if we um if we have the right strategy um and the strategy must come from the top where government <laughs> will force the um the 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 providers to say this we need a low broadband supply we need this kind of strategy this is the way we're rolling so yeah thank you for that um i i think you you're the king of uh, rtr and for the uh, for the team uh, on board it's red tape reduction and i just need to understand what are we going to do to reduce this red tape? Because it, it continuously, and I, you, I don't know if you were on at the beginning when I said my husband spent three de decades as a, um, a SME. And one of the most devastating part was the red tape. Because yeah. every time you wanted to do something, there was full of form, see a counselor, see a counselor, see someone, and you're still at ground zero seven years later sort of thing. So, yeah, I don't know if you have an, a, a, a practical solution and what government is doing to reduce the red tape. Yeah, look, look I think, um, yes, definitely. I mean, red, red tape, if you look at the, the, the GEM report, so it's the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Report since, I think, since, well, since 2001, every single year red tape comes up as a problem, whether it is registering a business, where it's paying tax, 
anything that's we're just getting i mean if you you think we're experiencing red tape what about the guy in the township who wants to start a business um he just can't start a business because his place is not zoned properly or well, the entire area is zoned uh, as, as, a, as a zoned residential and there's no chance of him getting actually exactly uh, commercial thing but anyway so from from our side i mean let's let's take the the, the provincial gov western Cape provincial government's uh, side what we've done is we've now We've got a, we've been running a unit since 2011, looking specifically at red tape reduction. Okay, I think we've been we've been very successful in highlighting this on a national level. We've now got what is called the national task team, and the task team is looking specifically at red tape related to SMMEs, right? So there's the net the DTI is looking at stuff with regard to exports and the higher level type of trade barrier things. And we're looking at the, at the SMME related stuff. But I think it's a lot still has got to be done with regard to the regulators such as SARS, uh, 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 CIPC, although CIPC has done quite a lot in terms of putting things online. So that makes it far more simpler. But you know, in in dealing with with, with some of the the success cases or, or, or the world class stuff, you have and, and and this is all again about but 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 tech, right? We we talk about government tech. In 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 the Netherlands, they talk about vraag net in or something like that. Uh, ask only once. Now, what it simply means is that if you put in your your social security number or your or your or your ID number, all your details become almost immediately available. So when you complete in anything, your details all you need to do is actually make that change, right? So so that is all what is called integrated government. Now exactly. what we're trying to do at the, in the Western Cape, this is exactly what we we, we try, what we're trying to achieve, is how do we on a provincial level do have a system in place that when a citizen of the Western Cape, for example, comes to to apply for a vehicle license. His details are pre-populated. He can do it online. It is sent to him electronically. He doesn't need to stand in a queue. Like my, my head of department says, what irks him is when he drives past a regulator and there's queues. Yes. You go to the master's court, there's a queue. No, no, no. A queue shows that there's inefficiency or there's something wrong. Not only can it be very demeaning to people, but there is something wrong. So how do we actually work together as government? Look, there's no simple solution. Very, very, there's seriously no simple solution to it. But I think certainly from our side in the Western Cape, we've been really battling to overcome this. We've now formed almost, I want to call it, special task teams that look at, at, at areas that, that is, that's affecting the Western Cape economy. For example, we're looking at the, at the efficiency of the port with regard to red tape. How do you make it easier for, for, for exporters and importers to do, do business? And we're doing this in collaboration with, 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 with national departments, with Transnet, with Portnet. So in a small way, that's what we're trying to push. And like I said, that it has, our efforts have been so far quite successful. And the fact that if you look now at, at national sort of uh, pronouncements, the reduction of red tape is now becoming a, a, a topic of discussion. Yes, of course, we're not moving fast now, but compared to five years ago, when you mentioned red type, people looked and said, what does red type mean? At least now there's some sort of recognition that red type is an important to be able to tackle. Um, Antona, can I just address those other three questions that I see? Yes, you're welcome. I, I was going to give them to you one by one, but um, uh, if you want to. Okay, could the business exit rate be attributed to insufficient stimulation and uncoordinated support of intervention of SMMEs? Host of reasons. If you go to if you go to the GEM report from our education system, we cannot have an education system where kids are in are encouraged not to do maths or at best to do maths lit. Now, entrepreneurship is about problem solving. Now, maths is about problem solving. How how can we be doing that? So, so if you go to the to 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 to, to all the, the the sort of uh, prominent literature, you would find that the education system becomes very very important in terms of your in terms of your your your, your growth of your SMEs. I agree, uh, again, borrowing from the gym. Are we doing enough to 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 champion SME to champion entrepreneurship? Right? Or is entrepreneurship seen as in many places in, 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 in townships, for example, as something which you know you do because you because you're desperate, right? Um, so 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 I don't think we're doing enough with regard to that one. Yes, they, um, it's also unco uncoordinated support, and again, it's coming to the table because what is actually happening is that we all have in our own tables, and 
each pulling in different direction when, when SME support the entrepreneurship demands an integrated approach. Right? So I fully agree with that when you need to be doing more with regard to that one. Does government have mechanisms in place to assess the impact of COVID-19 intervention support measures to SMMEs? Now, I think the, the, the impact of the interventions we've done, uh, we've allocated to what was about, I think, total almost 40 million rand to, to, to COVID interventions in terms of, uh, in terms of COVID relief. Uh, part of that support or part of that program is to actually go back and do some sort of monitoring and evaluation to see what that impact has, be, has, been, has been done or, 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 or what is the result. I, I, I think with, with quite a few programs, this is something which is lacking in that we implement and we, we almost tend to then neglect the fact that we also need to, to measure the impact of, of, of what we actually implemented. So I think certainly from, from if I can't, I can't speak for, for all of government, but certainly in my, my section in terms of enterprise development, this is exactly what we do in, in with all our programs, whether it's supply development, because at the end of the day, we need to show outcomes, right? So we need to show that of the 41 million that we spent, we've managed to save 5,000 jobs, right? So certainly from our side, we, we have those things in place. What can we be? What can we do better to develop viable, dynamic, self-reliant, and self-sustaining small enterprises? You know, I think it's again, it's maybe tied to the to the to the first question: is that how is that taken from the cradle up? You know, in terms yes. of, of of developing SMEs, developing entrepreneurs. I mean, are we inculcating the the, the entrepreneurship from a from a from a from an early level, whether it is ECDs, whether it is uh, at schools? You know, uh, again, we also see the 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 the, the stock divides. I mean, at the at the at the uh, a colleague was saying to me that uh, uh, her son is at the at the at the at a quite a good school, and uh, the son had to is going to start a business at the end of the year, and part of that uh, starting the business is doing a survey monkey survey amongst respondents. Now I look at that, and the, the kid is in what in, in grade in grade six or something like that, or grade seven. Now I think to myself, gee, was that that kid is going to be doing Survey Monkey at that stage? What about a kid who doesn't have access to it? So it's all those things. Is how do we actually inculcate that thing from a young age, and and how do we champion uh, um, uh, um, entrepreneurs? You know, do we see entrepreneurs as, as people that we must aspire to? Or, or is it something which, you know, I mean, rather find a job and, 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 and earn a sort of secure living and, and, and that's it. So I think a lot, lot can be done, certainly also from the private sector. And I think it, it can't only be from government. A very interesting thing, I'll just add this one to the GEM report, is that we actually also have a low rate, although we have a low, we have a low rate of entrepreneurial activity. In other words, people starting businesses and doing whatever they need to do on their own. We also have a low entrepreneurial rate. In other words, people working in businesses and starting new, coming up with new ideas and being innovative. So it's not only a outside of public uh, public sector thing private sector, it's also within the private sector, to what extent are, 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 are corporations encouraging innovation, new thinking, because that's in many cases how new ideas sprout. So, I mean, you get exposed to new ways of thinking, you maybe get a bit tired of working in the corporate and you start your own thing. And that's how you actually stimulate a, 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 a new market or a new way of actually doing things. Um, Okay, that. John. Um, data. Yeah, I mean, I think we touched on that. I think we've now. covered we've most of them. Um, yeah. And I see Motlacho is with us. Okay, I think that's that's about it, unless there are any more questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. I Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear um, I, th I thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I wish we had so much more time because there's definitely some excellent ways. You, you know, you established an extensive network um, in the Western Cape and uh, was, the was the best network in South Africa with regard when compared to other um, municipalities. And I think it's all about, it's not one solution for this future, this uncertain future. It's multiple solutions across the different sectors, business, private, SMEs, government, 
you know and as i said in the beginning there's not a lot maybe there's not a lot of entrepreneurs in our session but we all engage with them so we need to be able to present position ourselves to make them work because if they work we work you know an insurer a broker a banker needs an entrepreneur <laughs> whether we like it or not okay um i'm going to um thank you again and move on to our next and final speaker um Sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly. Our DG from Gauteng has a very well-developed network in academia, private sector, and government. Um, and I really welcome you. Thank you for making it this morning and look forward to your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my apologies for joining late. Uh, I was in a meeting with the MEC that I could not get out of. Um, I would have loved to start with the, um, the discussions, uh, but thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'll just, in the interest of time, uh, try to move as fast as possible. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. I'll just uh, focus it some sort of a snapshot uh, on the economic performance uh, and outlook, uh, basically focusing on the global economy, uh, South African economy, and um, then look at them um, from the economic point of view in terms of economic response to COVID-19, uh, look at the issues of uh, how the provincial government uh, economic response. Then I'll just highlight uh, key uh, small enterprise challenges and how as Gauteng government, we are trying to uh, support small businesses. Next slide, please. Um, move to the next slide. Uh, there's nothing much here except to, to show that um, in 2021, uh, uh, most uh, agencies uh, around the world, including IMF and, and World Bank are projecting that uh, uh, the global economy will rebound. Uh, but these are the figures that we are not necessarily need to be happy about uh, because we are basically moving from low base. Uh, most of you will be aware that uh, in 2020, our economy declined by, by 7%. Uh, so if we have um, uh, around 5.5% uh, in, in 2021, um, it implies that we are trying to re recalibrate back to where we were in 2020. Uh, on the on the on the um, right hand side of of the screen, you will see that there are projections for the uh, for economy SA economy uh, by different uh, organizations. The key message for us here uh, is that um, you will see that um, our our economy is uh, actually going to grow below the world average, and it has been like this uh, even uh, pre COVID. Uh, the implication of this is that uh, we, we are punching far below our weight, but it also implies that in terms of the um, economic significance of the country, uh, over time, if we continue in this manner, uh, due to compounding effect, we may end up uh, having less and less significant in the world. Next slide, please. Here, I'm just trying to project, if you can look at the far left and the far right, um, on the far left, we have the global financial crisis. On the far right, we've got a, a COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, you will see that uh, in 2009, uh, the global financial uh, crisis affected our economy. Our economy in that year declined by 1.5%, uh, but in 2020, our economy declined by 7%. The implication here is that uh, the, the implication of COVID-19 have a far-reaching impact than global financial crisis. But if you see between the two periods, between 2009 and 2020, you can see that uh, our economy has been uh, growing far below its, uh, its potential. Um, and this is where the issues of uh, SMMEs comes in. If our SMME can start uh, being properly supported, being sustainable, performing, uh, we should be able to uh, check up our growth. Um, uh, most statistics will, will tell you that um, uh, most, uh, about 70% of the businesses um, are not able to, to survive beyond three years. And, uh, and I think that's where we, as a country, we need to make sure that uh, 
we support our SMMEs. And at the end of the day, some of them are even able to grow and transition to, to big companies, uh, big firms, and stuff like that. And, and over time, also take advantage of the free trade in Africa. If you can please go to the next slide. Uh, I'm not going to waste time on this slide. This slide is to, is to show that um, uh, in quarter two, because of COVID-19, uh, as a country, we lost about 2.2 uh, uh, million jobs. Uh, but as at the end of, um, of fourth quarter, uh, we we have actually recovered 40% uh, of these jobs. So trying to get back to where we are. Uh, but I think this is the point where we need actually to have a sustainable um, SMMEs uh, so that uh, over time they're able to assist us to, to recover quickly what we have lost, but even to go beyond um, uh, the 2.2 million that we've lost so that uh, we're able to regain our employment. The figure that is always uh, problematic with this uh, is that uh, if we see uh, as of quarter four, uh, about um, 7.2 South Africans were not employed. Uh, but if you take into account those who are discouraged, 2.9 million. So you've got almost 10 million South Africans officially who are not employed. And I think this is where the, our SMEs can come in handy in terms of assisting us to deal with the triple challenges. Next slide, please. Here is just to show the, the difference between what we call official unemployment rate and, uh, and what you call expanded definition. Uh, you can see that in terms of expanded definition, our employment rate is, is above 40%. Uh, in terms of official, it's, it's around, um, it's in the 30s. Uh, but the, the issue is that, uh, uh, whether you talk about 30% or you talk about 40%, this unemployment rate is still too high. Uh, and I think, again, um, our only way out of this is to make sure that uh, we've got a, an, an, a sustainable SMME sector to help us with the situation. Next slide, please. So that we can save some time. Uh, next slide. Uh, as Gauteng provincial government, uh, learning from the economic recovery plan at the provincial level, uh, we came up with an economic recovery plan, uh, which uh, has got mainly four pillars. Uh, the, first, the first pillar deals with uh, industrial or sector intervention. The, 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 the second one deals with uh, uh, issues of economic infrastructure. Uh, the third one deals with the APEX program. Um, I think here we talk about issues of uh, special economic uh, zones as an example. We've got the issue of trade integration. Um, we are all aware that um, um, Africa is now opening for market uh, uh, for all of us, for, for our SMMEs to be able to take advantage of this big market that is going to be available for all of us to, to contribute. So you will see that the, at the center of this uh, plan, uh, we place SMMEs. We are saying that um, as a country, as a province, we need to support SMMEs. We need to ensure local production, local content. We also need to ensure that uh, both private sector and government provide market access to our small businesses. Uh, so this plan can, can be made or can also be broken by uh, SMMEs. If SMMEs are not at the center or are not um, performing optimally, um, the impact of this plan uh, will not reach the desired impact in terms of growth, in terms of employment, and in terms of um, dealing with issues of poverty reduction. So the, 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 the posture we're taking uh, in Houghton, for example, is to say that uh, um, in our um, infrastructure program, we must make sure that deliberately and consciously, uh, we make sure that uh, in the operation, in the construction and in the operation of this, infrastructures, we must make sure that the SMMEs are able to have access uh, in that space and are able to participate. But we also want to make sure that uh, as we get into Africa in terms of trade, we should be able to have a, a SMMEs that are supported, that have got products that they should be able to sell to the rest of Africa. In that way, they will be able to benefit from uh, uh, this important milestone in, in the economic cooperation of the continent. Next slide, please. 
Yes, uh, these are some of the key, key, key problems, uh, uh, challenges faced by small enterprises, uh, issues of finance, access to finance. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's not enough money uh, in the country in terms of supporting SMMEs. The issue is access. Uh, the issue of technical support. Uh, you, you want to make sure that SMMEs are able to run their businesses effectively and efficiently. SMMEs are, are able to produce product of of required quality. Uh, so here is where you need issues of uh, mentorship, uh, is where you need is uh, issues of incubation to make sure that uh, these SMMEs are able to put product of higher quality. Uh, as I said, in terms of finance or access to finance, uh, you must make sure that uh, uh, these SMMEs are, are provided with the right product in terms of financial support, uh, issues of brand finance, uh, uh, some of you will be aware that uh, um, I think most commercial banks, and I think even here in Gauteng, we, we provided most of our, our SMMEs on our, on our books uh, with um, a repayment holiday so that uh, they, they can be cushioned against uh, COVID-19. So we're also in the process of also making sure that uh, we, we, we are establishing a fund uh, with the Industrial Development Corporation to make sure that uh, with our little resources as government, we can leverage more money from the private sector uh, to make sure that uh, we are able to support more and more SMMEs. So this part of partnerships. Issues of market access, I can't overemphasize them. Most of the small enterprises are unable to compete with well-established big businesses. So government and private sector, we must all make sure that uh, to encourage SMMEs to grow, uh, over and above uh, providing them with financial support, over and above providing them with technical support, we must make sure that uh, they have market access. And over time, we believe that uh, they will be more and more competent and they'll, they'll also be able to put product of higher quality and they can also be able to compete with the best in the world and of course uh, in the continent as well. The other important issue that we have realized that uh, is, a, is a problem for small businesses is some of the government policies, uh, some of our laws. Uh, that's why in Gauteng now we were in the process of, uh, um, we, we, we've completed uh, a consultation on the Township Economy Development Bill. And uh, I think uh, be before the end of the year, it will become an act um, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, SMMEs, wherever they are, whether they are in townships, uh, whether they are uh, in semen, semen urban areas, are able to, to be properly supported uh, to be able to uh, produce product of uh, required quality. Um, uh, and again, of course, uh, you talk about product of, of required quality, but if you, you can't sell what you've produced, this means that uh, at the end of the day, you'll not be able to survive. My view is that uh, if as government, if as all real players in the space, were able to deal with issues of finance, were able to deal with issues of technical support, were able to deal with issues of market access, and make sure that uh, our policies are not prohibiting in terms of the growth and development of small enterprises. We should be able to solve our problems. If you go to the next slide, uh, the, the, the posture that the uh, Houting government has taken is, uh, is that um, we have got this, this three key, uh, I mean, this four key um, uh, legs of our business strategy. Uh, financial support uh, to SMMEs, but SMMEs also need uh, business development support, which we call non-financial support. But we, we also have to, to work with partners. Uh, in all provinces, there are a number of players, uh, whether NGOs, government, uh, uh, in, uh, private entities, uh, uh, international entities. All of us were working in the space of, of small businesses. If we converge, get into partnership, work together, we should be able to, uh, to, to support our SMEs better. We should be able to make sure that they're able to contribute effectively and efficiently to economic growth and job creation and uh, at the end of the day, issue of poverty. COVID-19 has also shown us that um, uh, it's very important to look at issues of business uh, continuity plan uh, so that uh, uh, even during pandemic, uh, businesses should still be able to operate. How do you keep on providing um, financial support? How do you keep on providing uh, business development support uh, even uh, uh, during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And in future, we can even have other pandemics. So this is how, as Gauteng Provincial Government, we, 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 are, we are also of the view that um, all these um, um, pillars are linked to each other. Uh, so 
from research, we, we know that um, um, uh, about uh, a 14 to 15% of the success of any business is dependent on financial support. Uh, but the rest, 85% uh, is non-financial. 85% uh, is uh, business development support. So it's very important to link uh, financial support uh, with business development support. Uh, if you provide a small business with uh, financial support, you must also do a, a full analysis of the whole value chain, check which other areas of the business need support uh, for that business to be able to, to prosper. Um, Non-financial support, as I said, will include issues of technical support, but will also include issues of market access and, and stuff like that. So just throwing money on the enterprise is not uh, good enough. As I said, 15% of the success of any business is um, um, uh, depend on the on, on fine support, while the rest is on other activities, uh, uh, including market access. Um, my next slide, I think this should be my uh, my last slide. Um, in a nutshell, uh, wh what I'm saying is that uh, uh, this uh, four key problems, uh, there may be other problems, but I think as a country, uh, working with all stakeholders in this space, uh, if we can be able to, to work together uh, converge on the issues of uh, access to finance, uh, converge on the issues of uh, technical support, converge, converge on the issues of um, um, uh, market access, but at the end of the day, ensuring that uh, we've got appropriate uh, government policies which are supportive of the growth uh, and development of SMMEs in the country. Thank you, uh, Program Facilitator. I hope I didn't take much time. I, I know it's supposed to finish at half past 10. So at least we still have got 10 minutes or so uh, to... You were the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, uh, for uh, giving us a quick and spend and taking the right time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So, um, Motlacho, is that right, how I pronounce it? I hope so. That's perfect. Um, well oh, pronounced. great. <laughs> So um, what I picked up from your presentation was that um, partnerships are so very important and in the end you called it convergences and um, you know there's there's a saying that says a single conversation with a wide man with a wise man is better than 10 years of study so you find that a lot of people say well I've done this course and that course and that course and now what but if you don't connect with trusted partners and sometimes we call them mentors and sometimes we call them government and we call them you know there's they've got all kinds of roles but those people are so important to enable the entrepreneur to reach the next level because on your own you can't so i i think it's quite important what you made there now before we i let you go because it's not going to be that easy i've got two questions for you um are are we ready to respond to the next global crisis, cyber, climate, or another pandemic based that we keep on saying, and now because of COVID and now because of COVID, what about the next global crisis? That's just around the corner, isn't it? I think it's a very important question. Uh, my view is that um, we are not there yet uh, as a country, but I think we are better prepared than we are now. And um, uh, hopefully, uh, the next crisis will not come in soon, uh, but I think uh, all systems are now in place to make sure that we we are ready. Uh, and I think even um, workplaces are now changing, taking shape. Uh, I, I don't think uh, we're, we're going to um, end up having um, everybody returning fully back to work. But I think that will be a missed opportunity. Yes. Uh, I was, I was uh, going through some research uh, recently uh, you won't believe that um, um, globally, 24% of people prefer to work from home. Mm. But in South Africa, 44% of us prefer to work from home. So we're far above uh, the global average. Uh, but, but I guess it's, it's, it's because we, we value more of flexi way of doing things in terms of uh, flex hours, uh, the studying and ending time. And I think... Uh, globally because um, most of them already they are in a flex mode so mm. they they don't see this uh, as extreme as we do uh, but but the fact of the matter is that uh, 
uh, we need to embrace the digital world. Uh, we need to make sure that um, uh, we are able to provide same quality of services uh, without having physical contact at all times. Uh, and I think uh, all of us, uh, all organizations, I think we are now uh, preparing. Unfortunately, uh, uh, certain sectors uh, will have to die. Um, uh, unfortunately, certain sectors are emerging. And I think this is where uh, uh, SMA means you should also uh, take that opportunity to get into these new spaces uh, because uh, you can imagine uh, um, uh, that um, South Africa, we were in the top 10 in terms of shopping centers. Uh, uh, and, uh, and you'll all agree that um, uh, malls in the next few years are going to change mm -hmm. uh, because people will want to go to the malls, not necessarily for shopping, for other things. So, yes. the, so the economy is changing. Uh, so as government, we should, uh, uh, working with partners, we should also be able to work with the sector and identify emerging sectors, uh, support as in the, uh, accordingly. But back to your question, I think uh, uh, come next uh, a pandemic, I think we should all be better prepared than we are. I think this one really caught most of us off guard. Yes. And I think yes. the economy of the surprisingly world yes. drastically. Yeah, but I think uh, that's my long answer, unfortunately. No, it's fine. I'm happy. Uh, Motlacho, we've got uh, a few more questions under the QA section. So if you like, I'll read them to you. Um, or you can open your QA um, folder mm -hmm. on your screen. There seems to be a huge funding gap between SMEs and financial service providers, according to recent IFC report. What is South Africa doing to address this and enhance SMEs' access to funding? You know, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, um, program facilitators, so the, the, the problem in South Africa is not money. I think we've got enough money in the system. The only thing that we need to do is to improve access, uh, make sure that uh, uh, our SMMEs, they've got their business plans ready uh, and where the business plans are not ready, uh, through our technical support, we should also be able to, for lack of better ways, sanitize all these applications and make sure that they are ready. And where they are not ready, you may find that some of them, we need to, to de-risk them, uh, provide some sort of plan, plan finance uh, combined with grant. So, so the issue is, uh, for me, it's not about the availability of money, it's about how do we work with partners, including commercial banks, to make sure that uh, we improve access. Uh, we we de-risk some of this um, uh, project uh, and we make sure that the, the access is improved. I mean, if you go to CEDA, you go, I mean, you go to CIFA, you go to the, 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 the funds that were currently, uh, I mean, recently established, you will see that the, 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 the the applications are coming, but very few are being funded. So the mm -hmm. issue is that they do, do we have the required quality of applications? Uh, are our SMME empowered enough to know how the application should look like? Do we have system in place to also make sure that this application, before they get into the system, we proactively sanitize them to make sure that uh, they are ready and help to readjust them accordingly. Uh, but and I think that is uh, what we are now trying to do here in Houding uh, it, in terms of saying that uh, uh, approach us with your application, let's work with you on your application, let's get it down or readjust it accordingly. Uh, where there's a need of blended finance, let's do that. Uh, where there's a need to, to make sure that, uh, it, because going forward, uh, even uh, government agencies must also take some of equity in this company, but, but not with the objective of owning, but with the objective of making sure that uh, they are assisted to be successful. And over time, uh, we can exit and let these uh, people run these businesses. But the more the merrier, the more we, we have most uh, businesses, the better. And the more we can be proud of, uh, of ourselves in terms of uh, contributing to um, trade in the continent, because we don't want to end up uh, uh, being a country which export, import things from Brazil, from China, from India, and come and sell them to the rest of Africa. That is not going to yes. help us in terms of uh, yeah. 
employment in terms of economic growth. Yes. Thank you. I've been given the two minute bell. So I know there's two more questions in the box. So if you could quickly answer those and then we'll close off. Great points. Um, there are key challenges faced by SMEs, but do you think market access is a primary problem and not more of a symptom due to high level of necessity driven by SMEs and SA? What's your view on the fact that an innovative SME will easily access and disrupt the market, just like an Uber, Twitter, or any other? Yes, the, the, the answer to the last question, part of the question is yes. And we, we need more innovators. And the, that's why here in Houting, we, we, we have established Innovation Hub. Uh, we bring young people there uh, to help us with innovation and, and some of the good ideas will then be supported. So the issue of market access, you, you really cannot uh, underplay it. Uh, it, it. It's one of the problem. Uh, alone market access is not a, a sufficient condition. Uh, you also need other conditions. But let's say you are able to produce, you are able to product of the right quality, but given that you are still small, you are operating at a given scale, your product may, may not benefit from the economies of size or economies of scale. So initially you need to be supported and I think that's where government should come in. Uh, and that's why uh, I always say that there's a price for anything. So for us to be able to promote SMEs in this country, we must be prepared to pay a price. And a price that we're prepared to pay is to make sure that uh, we are able to provide support to the small businesses to be able over time to compete with the best in the world. Because if we, it's like when opening up trade in certain uh, infant sector, uh, you want this infant sector in the country to immediately compete with the, rest, with the best in the world. Obviously that sector will be, will be destroyed. So protect it, uh, not forever. Uh, make sure that uh, it's, it's, it's ready to stand on its own and the, the future will be bright. Uh, but my, my view at the end of, end of the day is that I think it's not a matter of choice now uh, as a country. Uh, if we want to deal with this unemployment crisis, we need to support SMEs, both from the private sector point of view, but also from government point of view. Because if we deal with unemployment issues, we deal with, with poverty, there will be more money in terms of disposable income mm -hmm. in the country. More of us will be will be employed. Uh, government will be able to get more taxes. They will be able to provide more public. It's services. a win-win, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and even um, uh, 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 business itself, generally, they, they will be able to sell more because all of us we've got money. We're able to buy goods and services, and it's going to become a vicious circle and win for, for all of us. So it is in in the best interest of all of us to partner Absolutely. together and develop SMEs in this country. Okay, last question, one minute. Thank you um, for this exciting information from Onward Baruso. You have spoken of alliances with IDC. Um, in reality, do we have a formal non-bank institution that I, as a small business developer, can refer my clients and maybe assist them to access funding? Uh, I I don't know where the, 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 the question comes from, which province, uh, but uh, if you are in Houting, uh, please uh, uh, contact us. Um, but if you are in other province, uh, we have got network throughout the country. Uh, so my email is with the organizers. Uh, they can share uh, with you my email. We should be able to connect you with our counterpart. Uh, we've got CIFA, which is operating as a national agency, but operating in all provinces. We've got CEDA from a business development point of view, they also operate in all provinces. IDC themselves, they operate also in all provinces. Uh, but uh, as, as government uh, uh, provinces uh, and national, we work together. Uh, so whoever you can be able to get in touch with, please do so. Um, we should be able to assist you. Uh, I think my Thank you. email is available to, to be shared with the rest of the- All us. right. We've got one more barrier that we have to get through before we go to conclusion and closing. Um, BE or triple BE. How do I overcome 
and get my approval or disapproval as a SME? SME, which one to be? Because can I get the question properly? So the, the Black Economic Empowerment and getting approved for it. How, how does an SME do it? Quickly, easily, so that it does not become a barrier, a restriction. This is part of uh, what you call business development support. It's part of non-financial support. Um, I think if you're a small business, um, any CIFA, CIDA, in this case, uh, should be able to assist you. Uh, but failing which, uh, in your province, there's also uh, entities uh, responsible for a small business development. Uh, if not, uh, check with the Department of Economic Development. They will refer you to the right people. Each Department of Economic Development, they've got a section that deals with the uh, uh, Black Economic Empowerment. Uh, okay. So it shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Motlacho. I really yes. appreciated your time and your um, pearls of wisdom as well. Um, once again, I want to thank all our passionate speakers for their zeal and don't let's not forget our sponsor who uh, not only came to help us on this, uh, can help you on your risk journey, but can made this, this webinar possible. UMSA, of course, the only association in South Africa. So if you want to become risk management savvy, you need to join UMSA, be with Germs, UMSA and fulfill your, your aspirations. Um, in closing, I just want to say one point, and that is all cats love to fish, love fish, but the fear of wetting their, pears, their paws is a problem. So, of course, being an SME means that there's going to be risks, uncertainties, uncomfortable challenges, but it's not impossible if we have a deliberate, willing um, process and a risk managed process where we can go through the plan. Once in closing, I want to thank the Urmza support team in the background. They were absolutely wonderful. This new Zoom platform is much easier. And um, I thank all of you for attending and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and take every crisis as an opportunity. Thank you, everybody.